Bibles, turn to the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 28. Verse 11. Ezekiel chapter number 28 and verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say to him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. It hath set thee so, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. Father, bless this holy book tonight. Thy name I pray, amen. The book of Ezekiel is one of these prophets that have to do with the captivity. And coming back from the captivity, they're right in that time period. And when Israel was in captivity, they needed to be reminded of the sovereignty of their God even though he, uh, from all appearances, had allowed them to be taken captive by a pagan, heathen nation, he had not forsaken them. And he had his times and his ways that he manifested himself to Israel while they were in captivity. In 722 B.C., the ten northern tribes were carried off into Assyrian captivity and wound up being Samarians, Samaritans, where they had been mixed in with the Assyrians and and it literally affected the, uh, the race and, the, and the, uh, the, the, gen the genes of the people in the north. But the two southern tribes, Benjamin and Judah, were carried off into Babylonian captivity in 586 B.C. And in 586 B.C., they tore down the temple. They destroyed the city of Jerusalem, in effect, and carried the people in slavery, put them in slavery. And so there's no doubt in my mind that in their mind, a lot of them thought God had forsaken them. So where is, where is the Lord? But God had warned them through Jeremiah that uh, this was coming, and they wouldn't listen. And they had false prophets in the book of Jeremiah. When Jeremiah would prophesize, these false prophets would turn right around and prophesy against him. And so he had to deal with opposition. When we come to the book of Ezekiel, we come to one of the greatest books in the Old Testament that has to do with the sovereignty and the righteousness and the holiness of God. In the first chapter of the book of Ezekiel, you have cherubim that show up, a very mystical creature. There you find the throne of God on a set of wheels that's moving about, and you can't, it's not easy to understand what's going on with the, with the move about and have the way that Ezekiel describes the wheel within the wheel and all that's happening there. It's just, it's just a remarkable thing. But what we need to keep in mind is that cherubim were present in Ezekiel chapter number 1. Then when we get to the 10th chapter of the book, book of Ezekiel, we have cherubim showing up again. And these cherubim, of course, have something to do with God's sovereignty and his holiness. Now we come to the 28th chapter of the book of Ezekiel, and we find a cherub that shows up. Now, a lot of people, they don't make the distinction that I think they should. They simply say that it's an angel. And uh, angelic being is a, is a generic term. So what do you mean? It just simply means a being of the heavens that's around God and his throne, angelic. For example, a seraphim would be called an angelic being. Ball of fire that all it does is cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And you'll find that in the book of Isaiah chapter number 6. The Bible said in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. You have a contrast in Isaiah chapter number 6 between a leprous king, and if you've read the Old Testament, you'll know what he did. He violated the office of the priesthood and was smitten with leprosy right before their very eyes. And then he eventually died. In the same year that this leprous king died of a, of a, of a, of a hideous death, the Bible says the Lord manifested himself through the seraphim. He was lifted up. And Isaiah saw, the pro he saw this vision of the greatness and the glory of God. So the earthly king 
may have met his end, but the heavenly king is going on strong and nothing's going to change that whatsoever. This ball of fire, it's a seraphim. Seraph is the Hebrew word for fire, to burn. Seraph. That's a Hebrew word. So a seraphim is the plural of that, and it means one that is burning. And what this seraphim does is cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. God for manifesting his holiness. And holiness in the Old Testament is akin to holiness in the New. And it simply means he's apart, untouched, untouched by sin, untouched by rebellion, untouched by his creation. He is still, he cannot be perverted, he cannot be distorted, he cannot be contaminated. He's God Almighty. And he resigns, he resides from everlasting to everlasting. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever, does it ever say gracious, gracious, gracious. No more in the Bible does it ever say merciful, merciful, merciful. In triplet like that. Nowhere. But when it says holy, it says holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. That makes up the Godhead. So the seraphim shows up in the book of Isaiah chapter number 10, 6 rather. And here we have a beautiful vision in the book of Ezekiel of the glory of God. Because in chapter number 1 we have glory. Chapter number 10 we have glory. And then here in chapter number 28 of the book of Ezekiel we have glory again. Now what is a cherubim? A cherubim is a mystical creature. A cherubim is not God. A cherubim is a creature. He makes it plain in Ezekiel 28. Thou wast perfect in all thy ways from the day thou wast created. Created, no doubt, in a much higher order than man. The Bible said in Hebrews that man was made a little lower than the angels. I have a feeling that the cherubim is higher than the angels. Because the Bible says that here we have a cherub. And this cherub is the devil. And the Bible says the devil can transform himself into an angel of light. And so, therefore, we have a being that has enormous power. A man, the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an eagle, and the face of, of, a, uh, of, a, of an ox is what we find on the face of the cherubim. And he shows up in chapter number 1 and chapter number 10. And what is that? Well, if you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you've got each corresponding face. Matthew, you have the face of, the, uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the, Luke is the face of the man, all right? Uh, John is the face of the, of the eagle. Mark is the face of the ox. And then what is the face of the, of, of, that would you think? It would be the eagle in, 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 in Matthew. The eagle, the, the man in Luke, and the ox is the servant. And then, well, I'm getting them mixed up. The lion. The lion. <laughs> Thank you, brother. The lion in, uh, in Matthew. The eagle is John. Now, think about this for a moment. These creatures are on the face of a cherubim that was brought into existence before the earth was ever made. Now, one of two things is going on here. Either they are a prophecy of what God intends to do with humanity, or they change their very structure once something is changed on this earth in creation. We know this. We know the devil can transform himself. We know has, he has the capacity to change from one type of being into another. In the book of Revelation, it says he's a great red dragon. And there in Revelation, it says he's cast down to the earth. And he knows he hath but a short time, so therefore he persecutes the woman. He hath much rage. In chapter number 12, he's cast down. Chapter number 13, the Antichrist rises up. And the Antichrist receives his power from this creature, from this cherubim. The cherubim first shows up in the book of Genesis to keep the way to the tree of life with a flaming sword that goes in every direction. So therefore we read that cherubim is a special creature. When they finally built the tabernacle and then the temple, when you went into the Holy of Holies, you walked into the midst of cherubim. One cherubim on one side and one cherubim on the other side. And they looked down upon the mercy seat. They covered the mercy seat. And he says over here in Ezekiel, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. This is remarkable. He has a high and lifted up and exalted position. So who is this in Ezekiel 28? It's the devil. That's who it is. It's the devil. He's Satan. Look over here in Isaiah chapter 14. And verse number 12. 
Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? You've said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation, the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Lucifer is a Latin word, and it means light bearer. What we're looking at here in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 is somebody so closely akin, something so closely akin to the truth that you have to have spiritual discernment to know which one you're listening to. You're either listening to the devil or you're listening to God. You remember when Peter said, and the Lord said, I must go to Jerusalem be, and, and, be, and be handed over to the men and could be crucified, and then on the third day rise from the dead. And Peter said, not so, Lord, not so. He was looking at it naturally. And I mean, probably I would have said the same thing. He wouldn't want to see him crucified. He loved him. But he didn't understand the higher purpose in why he was here. And the higher purpose in why Christ came to this world was to not make friends and to have 12 disciples and to teach and preach to the people. These are all good things, but that's not what he came for. He came as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. And the only way that could be done was at the cross at Calvary. And the only man that could explain the cross was the Apostle Paul. He was the one who instructed them in the cross. It's not easy to understand. It's not easy to understand. This creature opens the churches all over America. He gets in the pulpits and opens the Bible and begins to preach from that Bible. This creature is so close to the Lord Jesus Christ that he's called another Christ. Christos. The word Christos is a Greek word that means anointed of God. It's the same as the Hebrew word Mashiach, which means the anointed one. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. So you got to be very careful because the Bible says he transforms his ministers into ministers of righteousness. And America has been cheated. Pulpits are full of men if they, in, this, in this country right now and all over the world for that matter. In this country, the only thing they care about is your money. That's all they care about. Mark it down. And I don't want to be mean tonight, but I'm going to tell you the truth. You get a hold of a preacher that all he talks about money, that's all he wants is money. And if all, he, all you hear out of him is prosperity, 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 that's not your problem. Sin is our problem. Prosperity is incidental. If you've prospered, good for you. God bless you. But the issue is not your prosperity. The issue is your sin. And the only way that sin can be made right is through the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a testing of it. In the book of 1 John, John the Apostle says, Here you can test the spirits. Any spirit that denies that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. Not of God. So what does that mean? That is the incarnation. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. That means that God is incarnate in a man. Because there's no question in John's mind who Jesus Christ is. When you read the Gospel of John, and I've read it to you, I think, last Sunday or whenever I preached, and it's over and over and over and over again. He's Son of God, Son of God, Son of God, Son of God. He's God, He's God, He's God, He's God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, God. The Lord Jesus is God. So when, jo when John says this in 1 John, he says, He that, if you don't confess that God has come in the flesh, you're not of God. You're not a Christian, you're not a brother. I was reading a lesbian a couple of days ago. What uh, They ordained her and put her in the Methodist church, I think last year, the year before. And she says that we have made an idol out of Jesus Christ. We have, li we, he, we have lifted him up too high. He was just another man like all the rest of us. He had his fears, his doubts, his problems. And, and you know, we can learn a great deal from his life. And we need to try to learn because this is the same life we live. You see what I'm saying? Now, that's a radical explanation or, uh, you know, illustration, but it's the truth. Now, how in the world, dear friends, if you're a Methodist, I don't hate you, but you better get it together. Amen. If you're going to support somebody that gets up and denigrates the Lord Jesus Christ, you are not my brother or my sister. You don't belong to the Lord. You're, you've been fooled. You've been deceived. 
Get out of that place. Don't let the, <laughs> my coach told me one time and when I'm high, he said, get out of here and don't let the door hit you in the back on the way up. <laughs> well, that's the same thing for them. When you exit that place, don't look back don't, and don't let it hit you in the back. Leave and get out of there and find yourself a Christian church. And the first doctrine of a Christian church, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And I was reading a brother yesterday. He's been gone now for some time, and he gave all the illustrations of the people down through the years that he had questioned. He had questioned that. He presented that question to them who professed to be Christians. And he said some of them denied it, but most of them agreed to it. So when you find one, dear friend, maybe somebody in your family, maybe somebody that goes to a church you know, if they deny that God has come in the flesh, they're not of God. Without controversy, great's the mystery of godliness. He who was manifest in the flesh. If that's in your Bible, throw it away. The Bible said without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was come in the flesh. And you, I've got a thing in the back called the critical apparatus, Nestle Allen's critical apparatus. It's simply this. It's the New Testament in Greek. And every single word they have a section underneath to show you the manuscript authority for that word. How many unctuals and cursives and, and pieces of old of, 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 of pieces of, of vellum and all of this, how many of them support this word? And when it comes to that word, God, theos is the Greek word for God, an overwhelming abundance of the material out there. And there's over 5,000 pieces of it support that word statement without controversy great is the mystery of godliness god was manifest in the flesh now let me say this to you tonight if you're listening to me why would you accept a bible that contradicts completely what the apostle john said you had to do in order to know that you are truly a christian and the holy ghost is residing in you if your bible says he who you got the wrong bible that Bible had better say, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh. Well, you say, preacher, is it that important? It is all important. Because if the Lord Jesus is not God Almighty manifest in the flesh, then let's just go somewhere and go fishing and, and you know, go bowling or play bingo or something. Because it's all a joke. And that's exactly what it is in these churches that deny his deity. It is a joke. And sometimes people need to be spoken to directly. So what kind of a doctrine would you call that? Doctrines of devils. That's what it's called. And that's what comes in the last days, the Apostle Paul said. Doctrines of devils. They shall depart from the faith. And that is apostasy is the Greek word for it. In other words, they become apostates. An apostate is someone who removes themselves from the truth of the word of God. They turn their back on it and they walk away from it. The other day, a young woman was shot to death up there in Chicago, Illinois, a police officer. I think she's 29 years old, shot to death for no real reason. But they, the police up there, which rightfully so, respected that and they lined up on both sides of the street to, when they moved her body from one place to the next showing great respect for her like they should do and which was, a, which was an honorable and right thing to do and it's such a shame that a young woman like that gets shot to death well the mayor came out and they turned their back on her amen. yeah they did <laughs> I'd have to say amen that was good they turn their back on her. And the reason for that is because they don't get any support. She doesn't, co she doesn't, she doesn't cover their back. And, and this is what happened. So uh, God bless the family and those that are, that are grieving over that young woman. And there's another police officer that was shot. And I don't know what his condition is tonight. I have no idea. But I just know that uh, the Cretan that shot him, shot both of them. Do you know what a Cretan is? Look at Titus chapter number 1. Let's find out tonight what a Cretan is. Titus. Chapter number one. 
Okay. Let's see. Oh, if you witness. So, verse 12. Here it is. Thank you, brother. Titus 1.12. Now look at this. One of them, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, now look at this. The Apostle Paul is quoting a pagan prophet. Okay? Nowhere in the New Testament at any time is the Apocrypha ever quoted. But they quote a pagan prophet. Now look at this. Look at this. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Now what you ought to do when you read something like that is to say, hold on a minute. You mean you're making a distinction with a group of people and they're just, they're not only sinners, but they're the worst kind of sinners? That's what he said. Go home and, and meditate on that this evening. Think about that. That's where the term Cretan comes from. The apostle Paul said, uh, the Cretans are liars, beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Here's what it says. It says that you can get people saved in their culture. And any, any missionary will tell you in a heartbeat, don't try to change their culture because everybody is not an American. See? And any missionary with any experience will come back and tell you that. You cannot make them, you know, let them, let them live in their culture the way they live. But when the Holy Spirit comes in and saves them, they're going to be a different person. They're going to be different. And they'll probably have a greater witness to their culture because those people know them and they see how they've changed. This is what he's saying to these people. He's saying, in your culture, and this is your culture, you come from a pretty bad place. And so now that you have been saved, because he puts it right here, rebuke them sharply. Now that you have been saved, while you're there, show something to these people that are your, that, that are your own kind. These are your people. Show something to them for the grace of God. Now, you take something like that and take it home, read it and pray over it and think about it because you've got a hold of something right there that will help you understand the Bible. For example, in the Old Testament, the Benjamites. You remember the Benjamites? You remember Benjamin? The tribe of Benjamin? It was the smallest of all the tribes. But did you know that there was a time in the Old Testament when the tribe of Benjamin was almost wiped from the face of the earth? It was. It was almost wiped from the face of the earth, all of it over a concubine and over some issues that were happening. And they, were all, they almost wiped them from the, face of the, from the face of the earth. Tribe of Benjamin. Now, is Benjamin important? Well, Benjamin and Judah make up the two southern tribes. It's very important. That's the witness that God told that he would leave in Jerusalem for his son David's sake, that he would leave a light in Jerusalem for his son David and servant and king. And so he did. So your adversary, the devil's a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Do you know what that next verse says? It doesn't say stop your drinking. No, it doesn't say to quit hanging out in bars. Now listen to me. I hope you don't misunderstand me. I'm not telling you to drink. <laughs> and I'm not telling you to run to bars. I'm trying to give it in context. What's the next thing he says? 1 Peter 5. You want to turn there and read it? Be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary of the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he, whom he may devour. Now what does it say? Look at it. Look at that, look at that text. Look at that text. Because that text is in the context. See, it's in the context. And it has to, it was a powerful, somebody read it for me tonight. Whom, whom What? That's it? Knowing. Knowing that the same are that are in the world. All right. Did you get that? Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing 
that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So Satan is going about to devour you based on that issue. That's a spiritual thing. Once he can ever get it into your mind that there really isn't no difference. It rains on the just and the unjust. What's the point in serving God? What use is there? There's no, you know, I mean, this is waste of time. I mean, what, 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 what am I doing? Or should it be, should it be this simple question? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. All right? This is in the world, but nor not of the world, but you're living for God, and you get sick and suffer and die just like the rest of them. Don't let Satan come along and devour you with something like that because that's one of his greatest lies. That's one of the greatest things he can do to devour somebody. After you've lived a while, you're going to see people die, and folks, there's no explanation for it. I mean, you can't, don't, don't, try, to, don't try to peg, you know, well, so-and-so died, well, I know why they died. No, you don't know why they died. <laughs> you don't know why they died. A lot of people die premature deaths. They die as young people. Good night, I'll never forget that young woman at, uh, at uh, Third Creek passed away, just a, just a kid practically, in her early 20s. And she was laying there in the casket and she had her wedding ring on. And her husband was standing next to the casket. And she just died from cancer, just died, you know. I remember the last thing she said before she passed away, I'm so weak. I remember her saying that, I am so weak, I am so weak. So what happened to her, preacher? Well, she went on to be with the Lord. That's what happened to her. We have to understand that. That's one of the greatest comforts that we have. We die like they die, but they die. Where do they go? <laughs> but if you leave this world, Paul said, it is far better to be with Christ. Amen. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's his promise to us. That's, that's comfort to us. And we don't, can't, can't figure it out. I'm not going to try. I'm wasting my time with that. I'm not going to figure out why everybody dies and why this happens and why that happens. I don't care about the why. I don't care, I don't, what I care about is the who. And I know that if the earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, I have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And this may be my last day walking on planet Earth. If it is, I'll meet you by the river because I know where I'm going. I know whom I believe. I don't expect to live the rest of my life in a rose garden. I don't expect to live the rest of my life free of problems and sorrows and all that comes to man, all that comes to him. I'm not, I don't expect that, but I do expect this. I'll never leave thee, nor I'll never forsake thee. I just want the discernment from God to know when he's with me. Never leave me, never forsake me. And that will get you victory over Satan because Satan's strongest weapon, and I'll say it again, is your relationship with God, he will come between you and God, and that's when he does his most, his dirtiest work. The first sin recorded in the Bible is when Satan came between Eve and Adam and God. That was the first one right there. He came between them. And that's, uh, that's what got us in the mess we're in now. And the only one that can get us out of that mess is the one who came down here and died for us. Hallelujah to God. Amen. Father, bless your word and time we have together tonight and the Holy Scriptures. Your faithfulness. We may not even understand your faithfulness when you're so faithful to us. We may not even be able to sense it at the time. But we surely will become victors in Christ over this world. And Father, I pray that there not be a soul in the house that that is devoured by the devil because he wants to devour us. He wants to, he wants to devour us. And the first thing he goes after in doing that is our faith. If he can, if he can cause us to begin to doubt our faith in your goodness and your grace and your provisions, he's gained a foothold. He's gained a foothold in Jesus name. Before we raise our head tonight, I'll pray again. I want to pray again, but I want to pray for anybody who raised your hand and say, Preacher, pray for me. I'm in a battle. I'm in a battle, and I want your prayers. God bless you there, and God bless you here, and God bless you over there. 
God bless you in the back. A lot of folks raising their hands tonight. You're in battle. All right, we are. I've been in a battle all day. Dog fight, knock down, drag out fight spiritually all day long. I have been. And we all do. We all go through that. Anybody else tonight? I've been in a battle, preacher. God bless you all. God bless you. God bless every one of you. Father, we know who giveth us the victory. We know where our victory comes from. It doesn't come from our mind. It doesn't come from our ability. It doesn't come from our reasoning or intellect. It comes from thee to take hold of what you've already done for us, and that cannot be shaken. You talk about the things in the book of Hebrews that cannot be shaken. They're permanent, and they're fixed. And, Lord, I know tonight that you've never forsaken us, you've never left us, and you still love us, and you're going to be with us regardless of what we face. And for these that raise their hand tonight, Lord, they acknowledge in the battle, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Because they're battling. They're still in the battle. That's good. Because if they ever stop raising their hand and there's no more of a battle, then we know who won. So, Father, tonight in Jesus' name, bless them, give them strength, fill them with the Holy Ghost, give them vision, understanding, and draw them near to thee, and then you draw near to them. In thy name I pray. Amen.